Hello and welcome to this session. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, about designing a go-to-market strategy, specifically from a product management standpoint. So uh, if you just Google go-to-market strategy and uh, read about it or, or uh, have any, any pick up any textbook around, around this particular subject, you will have enough information around the definitions and how uh, we go about building this and uh, what are the what are the key insights that that we should have before we um, start on a go to market strategy uh, this presentation uh, i'm going to focus mostly on my experience and and not kind of repeat the uh, the textbook stuff and and go into a, a larger definition of this particular strategy uh, my aim is uh, for you all to understand uh, in the real world scenario uh, what go-to-market strategy looks like, what are the common pitfalls, uh, and how you uh, have to sometimes pivot from your initial strategy to uh, drive the success. So let's get right into it. Right? So when you start on a go-to-market strategy, the first essential step is to define the value proposition of your product. Um, needless to say, that is probably the first thing you do when you start designing a product but uh, if, even even in the course of the product design and the documentation uh, the value proposition kind of uh, evolves and changes into something that uh, is slightly different to what you initially started off but when you are when you're thinking about a go to market strategy you should be crystal clear on what particular value proposition you are trying to drive once you have the value proposition, the next thing is the product market fit. Uh, you need to know like what specific problem this is going to solve. Uh, so you have the value props, you know the real world problems, you need to ensure that the problem is big enough to solve and you're basically able to join the leads. And as you move forward, you now know what is your specific target market. Like, which group of your customers are having this acute problem that your pro that your product is going to solve? Right? And based on that, you uh, uh, you work out the uh, entitlements, like basically the financials of this particular product, and and in, in the in the long term, what sort of money you're going to make through this, and then what the addressable opportunity is. It's essentially like it can be a very big entitlement, but uh, based on whatever assumptions you want to make on the market share or, 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 or uh, the adoption, what is the opportunity you want to address or you will be uh, meaningfully able to address uh, through this product. Then comes the risks and the mitigation plan for whatever strategy that you want to build. And, and uh, this is where you need to be very honest with yourselves in terms of hey, here are the things that we do not know, here are our blind spots, and, uh, and at least at, at a theoretical level, have a mitigation plan for all the uh, all the knowns. And there will be certain amount of unknowns there, but at least we would like to see that you have uh, crossed all the uh, all the known uh, issues and, and you, you, you pretty much are familiar with what sort of uh, risk this product has. Then once you go past that particular point, at this point in time, you have a, a clear value proposition in mind. Uh, you know, what sort of target audience or target customers you're looking for and what are the risks to the plan, uh, at that point in time, you start uh, driving an option of this product, right? You have to start, sorry, you have to start building the plan to drive an option of this particular product, right? And for that, you need to have proper communication plan and a proper marketing plan for you to kind of reach your customers, ensure they trust you, they value your product, and they're able to adopt a particular product. So let's get into an example. Uh, and uh, this is coming from my own experience, uh, uh, partly not entirely of launching uh, 3PL or working with 3PLs uh, in, the, in the last few years and, and working also in the supply chain domain for a, for a very long time, right? And uh, let's take this example and see uh, what sort of go-to-market strategy we would need at a very high level, of course. So, uh, for a 3PL and folks who are not familiar with what 3PL is, 3PL is a third party logistics. It's a company that uh, provides you certain uh, certain supply chain capabilities, like, for example, uh, a storage space to, to store your products, uh, 
some sort of uh, transportation mechanisms to move your product from the, the stored location into uh, different marketplaces, sometimes even fulfillment to your customers um, and, and various other value added services like you know, uh, quality assurance and, and so on. Uh, so in this particular example, we are assuming that uh, as a product manager, uh, you are building a 3PL service where uh, you, you're going to store products for your customers and also give them certain value-added services so that uh, they, they can have like a hands-off-the-wheel experience on their supply chain. Right? So in this example, if you think about it, why would a customer uh, adopt your pr uh, product or, adopt, or, or, or sign up for your CPA? I mean, the biggest point always is the cost. Right? Are you able to provide uh, a cost-effective solution that other major players are not able to provide? Right? What specific value-added services you're able to provide? Uh, because there are so many competitors in this particular market. Everybody has this uh, kind of a additional touch they have in their in their offerings that probably uh, makes it extremely difficult for you to create a niche for yourself. So you you should have or you probably must have a, a value-added service that you are going to provide, probably a, a, a spectrum of value-added services that the di different customer segments can actually have. Uh, now that you have a product, you've defined the value proposition, uh, you think about like what what particular market segment are you going to capture? Is it because like you, you want to capture the, uh, the, the, the businesses that are uh, mainly into e-commerce, they don't have their own physical locations. They're sourcing from some other country and probably they're looking for a hands of the wheel experience where they want to just uh, store it somewhere and, and then send it through to, to the e-commerce companies for fulfillment. Uh, it can be uh, businesses who have uh, multi-marketplace businesses like you know across the globe or even in the, in the same geography, they might have different uh, uh, different businesses that they that they uh, cater to. And uh, for them, uh, having a centrally uh, located storage just helps them to kind of move that inventory down to the right marketplace very quickly. Right? So you, as, as a product owner, you need to be very clear like what exactly you're trying to target and what's the product market fit for your product. And, and this is an example. Let us say you, you're starting off with the smaller businesses who have a a very difficult time negotiating contracts with the, the, the bigger supply chain products or bigger supply chain players or bigger 3PLs. So uh, you, you, you might want to just give them a very uh, kind of a niche experience, maybe have a lot of uh, handholding experience for them to grow their business and, and give them those capabilities which the other players may not be able to. So, so this is just an example. Let us say you are you are targeting the smaller businesses uh, who do not have enough volumes to uh, to necessarily uh, get good contracts with the from the bigger players. Now, what are the inherent risks of uh, this particular problem? Right, uh, the high investments because you are talking about uh, real estate here and probably a few million cubic foot because you need to have some amount of storage space. Uh, for you to kind of offer that to uh, the, the, that to your clients, uh, then it's it's a highly competitive market as as we've been speaking about. A uh, lot of players, a lot of big players with deep pockets. So unless and until uh, you have a very clear value prop, it's going to be very difficult for you to uh, to to manage these risks. Once you have these risks identified, of course you'll have to figure out uh, based on your strategy, what are the mitigation plans and ensure that you, you, you've thought through what are the fallback, fallback options are. Then once you get to a point where uh, you have uh, checked off these, uh, these four areas, then you think about a proper adoption strategy. How will you market this product to the smaller businesses? How would you ensure they come and adopt this particular product? And that probably becomes the key to your uh, the go to market strategy, right? Like, uh, okay, I know my product has these uh, great qualities and these great value props. I know it's a good fit. Um, I know the risks and I have a mitigation plan uh, and I know what, what is my target segment, but how do I reach out to those folks and, and tell them that, hey, look, this is a good product and you should have. 
and that requires a lot of adoption strategy. And adoption strategy is not necessarily the part of this conversation, but uh, that's a very important part of your overall go-to-market strategy. Now, well, once you build this whole strategy out, uh, the one thing you need to understand, this is not an unilateral exercise. This is something that you need to get product, business, engineering, finance, uh, sales and marketing, legal, and every department who are uh, associated with the product launch, all of them uh, to come together and help you build the strategy. The product manager here might be facilitating a lot of these conversations, might be building the initial strategy, but this needs to be thoroughly vetted by all these departments. For example, right when you're thinking about the risks and if it's a very high investment risk, then that is where you need to understand from finance, like what is their risk appetite? If there is a fallback option, sometimes they come up with their own fallback options and understand like what are the ramifications are of this strategy not working. Uh, similarly, if it's a new market that you're trying to enter, a new country or new geography you're trying to enter, legal is a very critical uh, department that you need to consult. And there are so many nuances to a particular uh, country, so many marketplace specific uh, requirements that you have to uh, abide by that uh, legal becomes a very important stakeholder there. And, and of course, uh, needless to say, product, business and engineering who are responsible for implementing the product, they all, all need to come together and ensure that you know, they meet the timelines, they, they offer the, the, the features that you have aligned on with them, uh, and they're able to you know, manage the cost of the product as well in the right way. Lastly, sales and marketing are extremely important to your adoption strategy. They are the, the, they are the folks that uh, basically reach the, out to the customers, uh, promote the product, ensure that you have the right kind of mechanisms to uh, go to the market with, with, with the right kind of ammunitions. So uh, all, all said and done, ultimately, as you can see, uh, the whole strategy pivots around uh, how you get the customer uh, onboarded to use your particular product. So your strategy needs to be customer. Everything you think about, uh, the, the few bullet points that we have talked about from value proposition to the product market fit to the target segmentation, everything should revolve around what ultimately uh, we are trying to achieve with, from, from our customer's lens, right? And it has to be fully customer driven. And if, if driving adoption with customers uh, are your goal, I mean, there can be different type of products. Too. Some products can be uh, marketed to a very niche segment to, uh, so that it's not like you know, adoption may not be the goal of it. It might be uh, you know, uh, high profitability kind of a product. But let's say if driving adoption is your goal, you, you should know who are your early adopters, who are the most likely customer segments that will come and adopt your product. Uh, what are the critical features for them? Like, why would they use this particular product? Are there is there a is there a gap in the market that uh, that, that that is today driving them not to use a bunch of the products, right? Uh, and and even if there is no gap, like even if they had to adopt your uh, product because of some reason, maybe financial reasons, do, what are the critical features that they need to even start on? What is their willingness to pay, right? Uh, be very humble about it. It's not necessarily that competitors are charging a particular price point. You can actually go ahead and charge uh, somewhat similar, right? If you are starting off and, and, and depending on where you are with your brand value, uh, you, you need to be very uh, data-driven around what the willingness to pay for your customers are. And, and this data sometimes comes from customer outreach, sometimes from surveys, sometimes from economic analysis, and most of the times, uh, all these three things working in conjunction. But essentially, you need to need to be able to clearly say at what price point uh, the product will actually start selling and to what degree. The next and a very important part is how do you build the trust with them, especially if you're a newcomer to the market? How do they know that there will be uh, the right kind of SLAs that you would be able to meet, right kind of customer service, uh, right kind of experience, even data privacy or, uh, or other critical features that are important for them to trust your product and use it for their business or for, for their own personal reasons, which is uh, very important to them. So building trust with them is very critical and uh, understanding the whole space a little bit more uh, in depth will help you. Like, you know, here are the 
major trust busters. Here is how I can go ahead and uh, build the trust with this customer segment. And lastly, how do you communicate with them? Uh, are you able to communicate with them uh, 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 through, through through a direct mechanism where there is an in-person connect? Is there a uh, electronic connect, connect? Or how, how do you want to like essentially uh, not only communicate to them about the new product, but also understand the feedback from them, uh, understand what they really look for and what, what they are getting or not getting from your product. So uh, you need to be very clear on what mechanisms you establish for two-way communication, not necessarily a uh, one-way communication where you're just promoting your product. The worst thing a PM can do uh, is to make assumptions around all this, right? Like all these five questions, and there can be several more, uh, all these questions should be extremely data-driven and extremely real world. You need to be very clear that you're able to connect with your customer, understand exactly what features they want or what exactly are they're willing to pay or how they, you can build their trust, how you can reach out to them and uh, have a two-way communication with them. If, if you are making assumptions around, okay, this is how it will work, it will probably uh, not be the right thing for you to do. You may very well uh, get into roadblocks that you could have very well circumvented if you had uh, reached out to your customers and got this data in, in a more uh, meaningful way. Now, once you have a, a particular strategy in place where you have uh, looked at the customer, you've engaged with them, you've understood what the problems are, you built the strategy around that, the next most important thing is to how to measure success, right? And uh, measuring success starts with defining clear metrics. And metrics are extremely important for you to uh, kind of set a goal or a success criteria around what do you want to achieve. And, and if it is something that you can uh, quantify and numerically define, that just makes your life much more easier as a product manager. Uh, without a clear metric, if you just want to launch a product and see how it goes, it generally never works, right? And the metrics can be very different for the same product depending on what your strategy is, right? And therefore, it's important for you to align with your sponsor, with your key stakeholders on, hey, here is the metric that we will be tracking, and uh, this is the goal that we want to achieve for this particular metric. If you do not do that, uh, that can just you know, create a lot of friction around, hey, is this product serving the purpose? Your go-to-market strategy may completely change based on what metric you are driving, right? So for the same product, right? Even for our example on around the three pairs, it can be an adoption goal that I would like to have at least a thousand customers by the end of the year. Uh, it, it can be a top line goal that uh, you want to drive this much revenue by the end of the year or a bottom line goal or a profitability goal where you're saying, hey, this is my uh, per unit or per uh, square foot, per cubic foot uh, uh, profitability that I want to achieve in this in this whole year. And your, your strategy might be very different. Like, for example, if you're thinking of adoption, you, you can onboard smaller sellers, but if you're looking at the top line uh, growth, then you might want to look at uh, bigger businesses who, who, are, uh, who are able to provide uh, that kind of revenue for you to make a lot of, lot of money out of them, right? Like, you know, consistently managing uh, to be close to 100% of utilization, uh, ensuring that they are subscribing to most of the value added services that you are offering, and so on. So, Essentially, your strategy completely changes. Your target segment completely changes. So uh, be very clear on how you define your um, success criteria and the metrics. Ultimately, misalignment on the success criteria or even in the metric that you're tracking is the single biggest uh, root cause of a go-to-market failure. I mean, it is, uh, I cannot emphasize this enough, right? You, you do one thing, your stakeholders don't agree with that you end up uh, being misaligned and then you say, okay, I've done this. And uh, the stakeholders say, oh, well, but this is not what we expected. 
And that becomes a big friction to drive the product strategy forward. However, if you have driven or you have defined the success uh, criteria clearly, even then there will be certain challenges. There are so much unknowns to consider when it comes to a go-to-market strategy that uh, even a clear definition of the success criteria will and, and thinking through all these things may not actually work in the real world. Right. So it's very important that as a product manager, you have the flexibility to strategically pivot into a new strategy. Right. Uh, so, for example, you plan to reach a certain level of adoption of your 3PL uh, by the end of the year. Uh, it's just an example. So uh, after six months, you work through it and you're only probably 10 percent of the goal and you know something's definitely not right. And, and at that point in time, you need to start asking what's going on, right? You've been patient, you've, you've, you've launched the features that you wanted to launch, uh, you've marketed aggressively, uh, you've reached out to a bunch of customers, understood what, what they're looking for, everything you've taken, still you do not get the right kind of adoption. You need to kind of, here are a few examples that you need to kind of uh, consider, right? Is the cost too high? Uh, do we have the right features? Uh, have we built enough trust? Right, like in some of those cases, like the right features and the trust, the customer may not even directly tell you that. Uh, the customer might uh, uh, subconsciously looking for a feature that you're not providing. Uh, the trust is also a very uh, innate uh, thing that the customer uh, is looking for. And, and it's, it's also sometimes very subconscious. So they may not be able to trust you even if you have created all these mechanisms. So. This is where uh, a seasoned product manager needs to go deeper, probably talk more to the early adopters, see what's going wrong, uh, do a little bit more survey. But essentially, if that requires you to pivot from your strategy, uh, quickly launch a few features that you have now discovered are important, quickly build a strategy around building more trust with those key uh, customer base, uh, that's, that's very important for you. Right? You need to be able to kind of pivot quickly and ensure that you know ultimately you are able to be true to your adoption goal. Right. Uh, once you have understood the root causes and you've decided how to go forward, please do ensure you have a retrospective in mind. Right. Uh, which basically means that what did we learn from the initial uh, phase where you did not have the right adoption? Right. Did we miss something at the first place, or was it something that was very uh, uh, something that, that you had to learn through the experience. It was not something that you would uh, essentially hypothesize at the beginning of the, of the exercise. Right. Uh, the reason that I, I say that you, you have to have a retrospective is because uh, as a product manager, uh, you're here as well as like, you know, you're, you're moving forward uh, in your career because you're, you, of your willingness to learn continuously. And sometimes just going back and thinking about it just helps you become a better product manager. Right. It helps you immensely try to grow that muscle where, oh, wow, this is something that I thought would work, but did not work. And here is how I can kind of uh, do better next time. So a few key insights that uh, that, that we have from different go to market strategies that even I have run in the past or I've been a part of. Right. Uh, first of all, as I said, be clear on the objectives, uh, which should define your success criteria and the metrics. Uh, Connect with your potential customers. Do not make assumptions. And that connection has to be uh, a two-way. Bring your stakeholders along and drive alignment up front on the strategy. Uh, Joe just assume that your stakeholders will be in agreement all the time. Uh, and if they are not in agreement, sometimes it's actually a good thing because now you have a different perspective and you're able to evolve the strategy even better. Uh, beware of the one-way door investments. So this again ties back to the strategic pivot part of it, uh, just to make it very clear. There will be scenarios where you make a bunch of investments on a particular feature or, or even for three people experience, maybe on the physical space or, or something similar to that. Uh, but if you make it in a way that's very rigid for you to reverse, or it's so, so high amount of investment that if that does not work out, it becomes a big problem for your company, then uh, then that's not a very good strategy. You need to always think, okay, here are the features that I am building. 
uh, if I need to pivot, then what are the ramifications? Can they be a two-way two-way door decision? Essentially, reversible decisions. Right. Uh, macroeconomic impacts are real, so be prepared. Right. Whether there is a, a pandemic or there's a global supply chain issue or there is a war that impacts oil prices, there are lot of macroeconomic impacts and every year the same 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 issue does not reoccur but there is some impact or the other something is happening in the world that is going to change your strategy so be prepared that hey these things will happen and as a product manager there will be certain amount of risk to your strategy certain amount of failures associated and how you can recover from that and move forward Right. Uh, if you have to pivot for any of these uh, reasons, reuse as much as possible. Ensure, right, like you are uh, able to uh, use whatever products you've built or whatever space you have created or whatever be the nature of your product, you're able to reuse as much. Uh, it's not a very good idea to again start from the scratch because sometimes that becomes too expensive. Uh, there can be reasons for that, of course, but uh, I mean, if you have done some amount of groundwork, in general, you would see that reusing is, is the best, uh, best way to go forward. And after you have pivoted and after you have built your own strategy around uh, the pivot, like how to move forward, please again drive alignment with your stakeholders because there, there might be a bunch of stakeholders who are residing in the past. They probably do not even know what you're thinking ahead. So it's important for you to drive that alignment as you move forward. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and listening through. I hope this gives you uh, some amount of insights on how uh, go-to-market strategies uh, really work in the in the real world scenario. So thank you very much.